Well, we turn now to the Word of God in Acts chapter 19. That's our text for today. Acts chapter 19. We'll be looking at verses 11 through 20. Uh, today we're picking, off where we, picking up where we left off before Resurrection Sunday. We took a break to be in 1 Corinthians 15. But now we're back with Paul in the city of Ephesus. And where we left off is that he's been teaching in the hall of Tyrannus, if you remember, for two whole years. And I want to begin our time together this morning by simply reading our text. Acts chapter 19, verses 11 through 20, which tells us of a very unique story. I think you'll think it's very unique that happens to him during this season of his ministry. So this is the word of God, the holy and all-powerful God, beginning in verse 11. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they were counted, and they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Let's pray. Our Father, from the breaking of the dawn, as we sang, to the setting of the sun, we want to be people that stand on every promise of your word. And Lord, how are we going to do that if we don't know your word? How are we going to do that if we don't know what's contained in what you've said to us? So we pray that this morning, in this hour, as we turn to your word, that we would trust and depend wholly on your enabling Holy Spirit to illumine our eyes, open our hearts, prepare our hearts for the truth that is in this text. There is certainly a lot to understand that might be difficult, but there's a lot to apply as well. So we need minds that are ready, but also hearts that are ready to receive the application of your word. And so we pray that you do this in us this morning. Amen. Well, in these verses that I just read, we come into full head-on contact with the mighty, divine, sovereign power of God. Look back at the first two verses of our text. It says that in the city of Ephesus, quote, God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Well, how extraordinary? Keep reading. So extraordinary that even handkerchiefs or aprons that he had touched, that had touched his skin, were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. I mean, extraordinary is an understatement. Uh, We come and open our text this morning, not to a persecuted Paul, uh, and not to a discouraged Paul, but we open our text this morning to a Paul who, as for two years now, as the text says, has been in this hall of tyrannous and is being used by God to perform these extraordinary miracles, uh, miracles that the Lord Jesus never performed himself. And you can go ahead and search the gospel records. You will not find anything like what we see in our text this morning. You might remember some who touched the Lord Jesus' garments while he was wearing them and were healed, yet these garments are different. These are ones that Paul simply touched, and after even one touch, the text implies, they were carried away to the sick and the demon oppressed, and their illnesses were gone, and the demons fled. I mean, these are some of the most exciting miracles and exciting times of Paul's entire ministry, and yet that really only sets up our text for today, because really, the crux of our text is the people's response. 
He's in a very exciting season in Ephesus. He's putting on full display the divine power of the living and almighty God. But really, the text is the people's response. In the scriptures, there are two responses to the divine power of God, the indisputable display of God's power. The first is that of Simon the Magician. And maybe you remember this in the book of Acts. He was confronted with the power of God as he saw the Holy Spirit fall on those Samaritans in Acts chapter 8. And what did he say to Simon Peter? Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. That's the first response. But the second response we see in the scriptures is one that we read in our scripture reading. It's that of Simon Peter. When he's confronted with the power of God as he witnesses that, witnesses that large catch of fish, fish at the command of Jesus, again, so much so in Luke 5 that the boats are sinking, well, what does he say? He falls on his face before the Lord, and he says, Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. The divine, indisputable power of God was utterly evident. And do you see the difference? It caused one to rise in lofty pride, to irreverent covetousness of that power. And it caused the other to fall in lowly humility, to reverent confession of his sins. And these are two responses to the power of God that we see in Scripture. And even though they're in different texts, well, our text is unique in that both of these responses are in our one text this morning. So that's our outline. Two responses to the power of God, irreverent covetousness and irreverent confession. Two responses to the power of God, irreverent covetousness and reverent confession. But brothers and sisters, before we jump into this text this morning, I want to make clear that we don't look into this text as if we're bystanders, uh, just looking into some historical museum exhibit. Well, that's not at all the case. This question demands to be asked of each here today, what is our response going to be to the power of God? Uh, there's not a single soul in this room who can be exempt from this question, because we may not have the apostles today, right? But what do we have? the apostles' testimony, the testimony that the first century miracles simply paved the way for us to have, the testimony that Peter, remember in 1 Peter, after talking about witnessing the transfiguration of Christ, he says this about the testimony that we have, quote, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you would do well to pay attention. Therefore, all of us here today have been confronted head-on with the indisputable divine power of God, evidence not only in creation, the creation that we all see, and that Paul says in Romans 1 bears witness to his divine power, but also in the word of God in your very lap. So the question comes to us, what is your response going to be to the power of God? Is it going to be this irreverent covetousness, or is it going to be this reverent confession. So let's look at the first response, a reverent covetousness in verses 13 through 16. I'm going to read these verses again. Verse 13, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. The seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Well, Paul is performing, as we've seen in verses 11 and 12, extraordinary miracles. And just like the Lord Jesus in his earthly ministry, miracles draw great crowds, right, and great attention. You know, whether you like it or not, you're going to get the great crowds and the great attention. That's because miracles captivate people, right? And they're drawing crowds. And though we're not told of maybe the many other groups that are drawn to Paul by these miracles, we are told in verse 13, look at the text, of one group in particular that's drawn to these miracles. And it's some of the, quote, itinerant Jewish exorcists. And I think the question before us now is, what on earth is an itinerant Jewish exorcist? It's the only time you'll see this sort of group in Scripture. You never see this anywhere else. Itinerant Jewish exorcist. Well, let's break this down. Itinerant, maybe you've heard that word before, means that they're traveling from place to place. Maybe you've heard of an itinerant preacher, right, who would travel from place to place. 
The second word, Jewish, tells us that they are physically descended from Abraham, right? They're ethnic Jews. But out of all of these descriptors, exorcist gives us the most insight. These traveling physical descendants of Abraham are immersed in the pagan and godless occult of sorcery. They travel around really as con men, offering their services of demon exorcism to anyone who's gullible enough to fall for it. And our discussion of these people continues, because there's a lot that you need to know about these people in order to understand this text. So first, it says that they're sons of a Jewish high priest named Skeva, which is interesting because if you were to search the Jewish records, there's no such thing. There's no such high priest with this name Skeva, which has puzzled people for many years. However, I think the Christians that are studying this issue may be just as fooled as the people that they lied to in their day. It was very common for con men like this to take on false titles, right? They want to attract business, so they'd call themselves high priests and things like that. Well, it seems that Luke is probably just recording their false boast, calling them high priests. Maybe if there were grammar in the original manuscripts, he'd put quotation marks around it. These high priests, sons of a high priest named Skeva. So that's the first thing you need to know. Second, you need to know that maybe they cast out a demon here or there. But that would be from the power of the demon and not the exorcist. What we see all over scripture is that demons love to deceive people, right? They are professional deceivers. And having the ability to voluntarily leave a person whenever they wanted, uh, these con men could leave as soon as someone exorcised them to deceive gullible people into falsehood. So maybe they did exorcise a demon here or there, but that would be from the power of the demon and not the exorcist. Lastly, what you need to know about these itinerant Jewish exorcists is that they're syncretists. Maybe you've heard that word before, a syncretist. It means that they don't just have one religion. Rather, they dabble in every sort of religion. We know this in part even because the archaeologists have found their magic spell books. Their magic spell books dating back to this very time in the city of Ephesus. And if you were to go and see them in a lot of the famous European museums, you could see names like this. There's some that you would see, they'd say Zeus, right, or Hermes, these Greek mythological gods that they would invoke in their spells. Some of the other texts you'd find, these spell books and these museums of theirs, uh, you'd see the names of the Roman emperors, you know, that they often deified and, and uh, convinced the people that the, the Roman emperors were gods. And yet if you were to go and look at some of these manuscripts, one is even on exhibit in Paris, you would find this line, I adjure you by Jesus, the God of the Hebrews. And that's exactly what we see happening in our text this morning. These sons of a pseudo-Jewish high priest named Skeva, they want to invoke any trendy name that will delight their clients and may potentially have the power to exercise a demon. And seeing the indisputable power of God working through Paul, right, and the immense popularity that it's bringing him and wanting some of that power for themselves, well, these sons of Sceva say with the covetous heart of Simon the magician in verse 13, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Now, here's a question for you. How would you respond if you were that demon? This is the only time I want you to think like a demon, okay? Put yourself in the demon's shoes. Put yourself in the moment. How would you respond to these fakes that are trying to tack on the name of, of not a made-up God, not a powerless God, but of the Son, of the one true living Almighty God, how would you respond? As a demon, you'd probably love to play games with these fakes when they're using the names of pseudo-gods, right? Maybe you're faking an exorcism to deceive them, or maybe you're just ignoring them altogether. However, you did not just hear the name of a puny God, or a fake God, or a powerless God. You just heard these itinerant Jewish exorcists use the name of the Alpha and the Omega, right? The beginning and the end, the first and the last. You just heard these con men invoke the name of the Son of God, who you as a demon and all your fellow demons cower before. I mean, do you remember that story in the gospel records where Jesus confronts the two demons coming out of the tombs? Do you remember what those demons do? Do you remember what the demons say to the Lord Jesus? They fall before him, and they're begging him, and they say this, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? If you cast us out, please send us away into the herd of pigs. If you're a demon, you don't mess around with the name of Jesus. You fear the name of Jesus. 
You fear the name of Jesus, just like we see them do all over the scripture. You fear the Lord Jesus when you hear this name. But then you look at these con men and you think, I don't know who you are. Look at verse 15. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know. Paul, I recognize. But who are you? I don't know you. I know Jesus. I mean, how could you not know and fear Jesus? He's the son of God. And I know Paul. How could I not know and fear Paul? He is a commissioned apostle of the Son of God. But who on earth are you? And there's a tinge of humor that I think we can appreciate. It's, it's almost kind of funny. But as we're appreciating the confession, the humor of the demon's confession, we also have to appreciate the theology of this demon's confession. It's not as if anyone off the street, anyone off the side of the road, has the authority over the demonic realm to exercise demons. First, we see authority over the demonic realm. It's possessed by the Son of God himself. We see this in the Gospels. As the Lord Jesus in his earthly ministry, he casts out a multitude of demons. A second authority over the demonic realm is possessed by his 12 personally commissioned apostles. Let me read you Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. And he, that is Jesus, and Jesus called to him his 12 disciples. And gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. And third and finally, authority over the demonic realm is possessed by any whom Jesus or the apostles personally, in person, give this power. We see this several times in scripture, uh, such as the 70 servants of Luke 10, if you remember that, whom Jesus sends out, or the seven servants of Acts 6, including Stephen and Philip. But these Jewish itinerant exorcists, itinerant Jewish exorcists, you know, who gave them authority over the demonic realm? Not Jesus nor the apostles. And this demon, seeing that these people have no power over him, well, he teaches these itinerant Jewish exorcists a lesson they will not forget. Look at verse 16. Verse 16. And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of that house naked, and wounded. We arrive now at the first response that we see in this text to the power of God, and that is a reverent covetousness, a reverent covetousness. Uh, There's both an action and an attitude in the opposite order, an attitude and then an action that characterize both of these responses that we're going to see in Ephesus. And with this first response that we see, it's the attitude of a reverency and the action of covetousness, the first response, a reverent covetousness. I mean, I think it's obvious that if these verses teach anything, they teach that the Lord Jesus is not to be trifled with. He's not to be treated with a reverence. He is not to be handled lightly or frivolously. The Lord Jesus Christ as the one true, he's the living and almighty God. He's not to be treated like the powerless and puny gods of pagan culture, just like these itinerant Jewish exorcists have the gall to tack him onto their list of deities and consider him on par with the rest. Not at all. The Lord Jesus Christ, as the Son of the living God, he's fully holy. He's utterly other. He is completely in a category of his own. And so as we're looking at this, we know that you and I don't have any right to mimic the irreverent attitude that we see here and thus treat him like we treat anything else. Uh, to treat the Lord Jesus lightly or frivolously or with careless, carelessness. Uh, he demands that we treat him as the holy God that he and he alone is. And you can see this all over Scripture. I mean, let's call to the witness stand Nadab and Abihu of Leviticus 10. And let's, uh, let's ask them if we can treat the Lord with this irreverence or treat him like we treat anything else. You can call forward Ananias and Sapphira of Acts chapter 5. You could call forward those of 1 Corinthians 11 who profane the Lord's Supper. You could call forward any demon in the whole demonic realm. And we could ask them, can you treat the Lord with a reverence and not face the just consequences? This is the attitude that we see in this first response to the power of God in our text. And it's not just an attitude of a reverency alone. It's also an action. These itinerant Jewish exorcists, with the attitude of, again, this daring irreverency that we see, they take the holy, holy, holy God and use him as a means to covet their own sinful lust of power. Do you see this? 
They see the divine, indisputable power of God as plainly, clearly, evidently displayed by Paul in the city of Ephesus. And then they think to themselves in response, how can I use him for my benefit? How can I have some of his power for myself? How can I take advantage of this powerful Jesus for my own personal gain? Brothers and sisters, it is this irreverent covetousness that we see from these sons of Sceva as the first response to the power of God in the city of Ephesus that, honestly, we need to avoid at all costs. But sadly, I think if we're being honest, we as humans are actually bent towards this response in our hearts. Just like these exorcists were tempted to think and to live, whether consciously or subconsciously, in our hearts and in our lives, the very same way with this irreverent covetousness. Concerning our reverence of the all-powerful God, we think to ourselves some of these questions. How can I add the Lord Jesus to my life and still live the way that I want? How can I add the Lord Jesus to my life and not sacrifice that much? How can I add the Lord Jesus to my life while continuing to worship my idol gods of my time, money, affections, goals, thoughts, and relationships with a white-knuckle grip of control instead of submitting them to his lordship? In other words, how can I set up the Lord alongside the other areas of my life instead of submitting the other areas of my life under the Lord? That's the irreverent heart that we can have. But we can also have the covetous heart. Uh, Concerning our covetousness of this all-powerful God's power, we can think the very same way. We can think questions like this. How can I use his church to advance my own interests, to add to my own resume, to clean up my own family, to bolster my own reputation in the sight of others? In essence, how can I use the Lord as a means to my own covetous ends? Instead of me being used in his service for his glory, how can he be used in my service for my glory? How can I have some of his power for myself? And we can do this in a lot of ways. Serving in the Lord's church for the sake of a personal title or position or for the sake of control or power. Participating in the Lord's church to mask or justify a sinful lifestyle or to somehow ease our guilty conscience. Uh, growing in the knowledge of God's word, the Bible, just so others think more highly of us, or to fuel our own selfish and sinful arrogance, evaluating local churches based on, not, based on not how well you could serve and honor the Lord there, but how well that church could honor and serve you. It's totally backwards, right? And we can think any of these thoughts, do any of these actions as if God would ever allow that, as if we would ever get away with having this heart, treating him as one of many areas of our life or using him for our own covetous purposes without facing the just consequences. The truth is, is that we don't add the Lord Jesus to our life. He becomes your life. You don't just use the Lord Jesus as a means to an end. No, he is the end in and of himself. You don't use him to glory in something else. No, he is the very object in which we glory. The Lord Jesus, as the holy, all-powerful God that we see in our text, he will not allow this response to his divine power. He will only allow one response to his divine power, and it is not this irreverent covetousness. It's reverent confession, which is our second response to the power of God we see here in this text. Reverent confession. In verses 17 through 20, this is the response that God will allow. Let me read these verses again. Reverent confession, verses 17 through 20. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. And fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. It's estimated that the population of Ephesus at this time would have been a quarter million people. 
And look back at verse 17. It says that this incident with the sons of Sceva became known to all the residents of Ephesus, uh, both to all the ethnic Jews and all the ethnic non-Jews or Greeks or, or Gentiles. And honestly, how could an event like this that we just read about not be known to all the people? And you, you had already seen or, or knew of someone who had seen in Ephesus the extraordinary miracles put on by Paul. I mean, it's attracting everyone. They're all drawn to this. And then you hear that those itinerant Jewish exorcists in the city that you've known for a long time and, and maybe in some sense you revere and you fear and you almost honor, well, they tried to use the names of Jesus and Paul as you're hearing the story. And the most amazing part of the story that you're hearing is that the demon says he knows Jesus and knows Paul but doesn't know them. They were beat. They were overpowered. They were humiliated. I mean, if you're hearing this story in the city of Ephesus, this only confirms the power of Jesus and Paul. It only confirms the, the power of Jesus and fall, of Paul. And we know this because the names come from the demon's very lips. I mean, everyone would have known this. And so what's the response of the city to this story? What is it? Verse 17, fear. Fear, verse 17, and fear fell upon them all. And it was not only a fear, but it was a fear that extolled, the text says, that lifted high the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, what we need to know, and maybe we already know, is that even demons fear the Lord Jesus. And we've seen it in the scriptures. We see it very clearly taught in James 1.20, that they shudder before the Lord. But just because the demons fear the Lord Jesus, that doesn't mean that the demons are saved, right? That doesn't mean that they're followers of Christ. Well, of course not. We see that this Jesus extolling fear falls on the whole city. And even though the whole city isn't saved, we see that many individuals are saved. Look at verse 18. Also, many of those who are now believers came. As a result of this incident with the sons of Sceva in the city of Ephesus, many did believe. Not the whole city, but many did believe and began to follow Christ. In fact, the text says that the many of those who came were those who had formerly practiced magic. Look at verse 18. It says that these new believers were confessing and divulging their practices. Now, I'm not a magician. I don't know if you are, but you don't have to be a magician to know that magicians don't share their secrets, right? They don't. And even more so in this culture. It was thought that if you confess your spells, if you show people your spell books, well, they lose their power. And so here we see a fear of the Lord Jesus that is producing a genuine repentance, divulging, confessing their practices, a genuine turning from their old life to their new life. Just like Paul said to the Thessalonians that they forsook their idols, maybe you remember this verse, they forsook their idols to serve the living God. Well, here we see in the city of Ephesus, the Ephesians forsaking their pseudo-powerful magic to serve the all-powerful God. And it does not stop with the divulging of the practices. This keeps going and multiplying in the city. Uh, look at the rest of our, our text. Not only were they, as we've already read in verse 18, confessing and divulging their practices, but look at verse 19. In addition, it says a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. You know, they didn't just confess with their mouth their spells and then keep their spells to themselves in their secret places. No, they took their secret spells, brought them in the sight of all, confessing them, also burning them in the sight of all. And there's just such an excitement in this text that we would miss if we weren't excited as well. There's an excitement in this text uh, that, honestly, if we're going to understand this text and put ourselves in the moment in Ephesus, well, we have to be excited for this as well. You know, I suppose they could have just thrown away the, the spells privately, but that's not what they did. They thought to themselves, let's go light these books. Yes, we confess the spells, but let's now take these books and light them on fire right in the middle of the city right in the middle of the city of Ephesus, which was known for its magic. It was known for the occult. Let's go do that. And as more people are bringing these books, as we see in the text, it feels like it turns into a bonfire of these spell books right in the middle of the city. They're probably just amazed at the sight of this, and they think to themselves, you know, we need to count the cost. I mean, this would probably be an amazing cost. And so they count the cost. They begin to count and count and count some more. And as more books are brought, we're actually told the total cost 
of the books that they're bringing to this bonfire. Look at verse 19. 50,000 pieces of silver. And man, it would be wrong of us if we pass over that number lightly. That is 50,000 days wages. That is 137 years of their labor at the cost of these books. And that makes verse 20 make perfect sense. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. But we know that. Our second response to the power of God that we see here in this text is reverent confession. Reverent confession. And friends, here is our blueprint. Here is our blueprint on the proper and only worthy response to the power of God. Here is our template for seeing how genuine believers respond to the display of God's glorious power. I don't think there's any doubt in any of our minds that these people burning their books are genuine believers. Why? Well, look at their fruit. Look at the fruit they're producing here in the city. Instead of responding with the attitude of irreverence that we saw with the sons of Sceva, treating the Lord Jesus like any of the rest of the pagan gods, they respond with the attitude of reverence. They are struck. Just like the people in the day of Pentecost, it says they were cut to the heart with the fear of God. The fear of God that, as our text even says, extols the Lord Jesus alone at the very top, all by himself as the holy God that he is. And it wasn't really only the reverence, but they also have another action that's not covetousness. Instead of responding with this action of covetousness that we saw uh, with the sons of Sceva, just treating the Lord Jesus as a means to their own selfish ends, well, what's their action? It's the action of confession. And not only with their words, but with their actions as they take these wicked magic books and literally burn them right in the middle of the city in the sight of everyone they know. In response to the power of God, these new believers don't rise above God in lofty pride like those sons of Sceva. But they fall before him in lowly humility. They're not coveting God's power for themselves. What can I get out of this? They're confessing their powerlessness to have him. They clearly see the power of God on display here in the city, and they immediately swear allegiance to the Lord Jesus alone and evidence this reality in their hearts and their lives by the burning smell and the black smoke of their former wickedness. Brothers and sisters, I hope we can see the difference, right, in these two responses to the power of God. This is the response that honors our Lord. This is the only response that our Lord will allow for those who savingly know him. When this is our response to God's indisputable, evident, clear power, those former irreverent and covetous questions that I listed off, well, they become totally reversed. Listen to this. Concerning now our reverence of the all-powerful God, here's some questions that we can think to ourselves. How can I make Jesus the Lord of my life and live in a way that pleases him? How can I make Jesus the Lord of my life and offer my life as a living sacrifice? How can I make Jesus the Lord of my life and cease worshiping my idol gods of my time and money, my affections, goals, thoughts, and relationships, and submit them all to his control? You see the difference? Well, this is also true concerning our confession of the all-powerful God's power. Instead of covetous questions, we can think to ourselves questions like this. How can I use his church to advance his interests? To serve my fellow believers. To serve my family well. To decrease myself so that he may increase. How can, I use the, how can the all-powerful God use me for his righteous ends? Instead of him being used in my service for my glory, how can I be used in his service for his glory. So here's our outline of the text, two responses to the power of God and their polar opposites, a reverent covetousness and reverent confession. And as we close here today, here's a question for you that really sums up the application of this text and the differences. What is most attractive to you about the gospel? Is it the power Or is it the God behind the power? Is it the bread that fills your stomachs? What God can do for you? 
or is it the giver of the bread himself? The power of God's word, the power of the gospel will not be allowed by God to be used by you for anything other than God's intended purpose. And what is the purpose of God's power? For Paul says in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. Indeed, in Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks saw God's power in our text. And to them and to you is extended the invitation to come, and even as a believer, to continually come, to not in a reverent covetousness of God's power, but a reverent confession. And like these former magicians in Ephesus, to forsake, to genuinely forsake, and as a believer, to continue to genuinely forsake your old life of wickedness and swear allegiance by humble faith alone to the holy, all-powerful God in reverent fear. So here's the question. Are you Simon the magician or Simon Peter? Give me this power also, or when you see the power of God, Lord, I am a sinner. Irreverent covetousness or reverent confession. I think we would all agree that God has shown his divine, indisputable power to us. We see it in the word of God. We see it even in the creation, the created order. And we also see it in the transformed lives of both ourselves and others around us. We see the power of God. And just as much as we have been confronted with the power of God, we're also confronted with the God behind the power who demands an answer to this question, how are you going to respond? Are you going to serve this all-powerful God? Or are you going to make this all-powerful God serve you? Let's close in prayer. Our Father, we look to you alone to produce in us the heart that falls before you in lowly humility. We do confess that our human heart, our fleshly heart, is so bent towards covetousness, is so bent towards a selfishness, a sinful selfishness. And Lord, we pray that you would till our hearts, you would soften our hearts, that they would be made low, that we wouldn't ever think to use you for our own ends, but to glory in you, in you alone. Father, in small groups today, I pray that you'd be with the discussion Help us all to analyze our hearts, even if we've never thought about this as being a reality in our lives before. Help us to do honest self-diagnosis of our motives and help us glorify you in the process. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.